everyone. Welcome to See the Invisible, Living with an Invisible or Rare Disease. My name is Rhonda Franny Jefferson, and thank you so much for taking some time out to listen today. I really do appreciate the opportunity to try to share my experiences and talk about ways that we can cope with everyday challenges, share our successes, and adapt to today's ever-changing health climate. Um, I also want to show support for those who support us our family members, our friends, anyone who, you know, shows support for us in each and every day. Um, if you're new to this podcast, thank you very much for choosing it and, you know, just giving it a chance. Um, I'm relatively new at this. If you had told me two years ago I'd be working on a podcast, I would have said no way. Um, but here I am. And if you're a returning listener, thank you so much for continuing to tune in. Um, now I do just want to turn my thoughts over for a minute to those who have been affected by the severe weather that we've had in many parts of the country, you know, especially in some of the southern states. My th thoughts are with all of you. Um, you know, I know that you know, having access to things that we take for granted to be able or to be going through that right now, I am you know, just thinking of you guys. I do know too through just some information that I can see through the podcast and I can't really see specifics, but it looks like I have at least one listener in Texas. So if you, can, you know, are listening and can hear this podcast, um, just know that, you know, I'm sending my support just through, you know, my thoughts and everything that, you know, I'm really thinking of everyone down there who has experienced this weather and, you know, they d that don't have access to everything that they need right now. So um, before I really get started with the podcast, I always do want to say that, you know, I am in no way a medical insurance or legal expert. I just hope to share some of my experiences and provide some information. Usually I find things through public websites and, you know, today I'm going to be going more about an opinion piece. But, you know, a lot of times I do refer to, um, you know, papers or articles that I've found online. So I will make sure that I link all of those in the description. For today, I didn't really use articles as reference material as much, but I did just read through a few things. So I'll make sure that they're included um, in the description. And so, you know, today I am looking at trying to record the podcast along with the video. Um, like I said, today is more of an opinion um, about things, and I really think it's important to bring an individual you know, to that, um, not just a voice that you can't put a face to. So you know, I'm trying this for the first time. I apologize if the audio is not great. I'm trying to improvise in some ways, but hopefully it all comes through. So, um, really, I guess, again, I'm looking more about or talking about opinion today um, based on some of my experiences. Now, um, you may have heard me say something to the effect before that everybody's experiences shapes them, that, you know, it forms their belief system. So I know that, you know, even if I have some, if I meet someone who has a similar disease, their background, their experiences, they're all going to be different than mine. So the way they approach things or the opinions that they hold may be different, but we should still respect each other. Um, and by we, I'm talking more of everybody, not just those who have an invisible disease, but you know, everybody needs to have their opinions respected because regardless of whether or not we actually share the same opinion, there have been things that may have happened in that person's life that helped shape their opinion. So um, a few episodes ago, I did start to go over how we should handle some misconceptions, you know, how people may think about those of us with an invisible disease. So I actually started thinking, and I wonder sometimes if it's not that it's a misconception, but maybe it's something that they're saying or doing with the best of intentions and it just comes out wrong, or it can be perceived you know, differently than what they mean. So 
you know, again, that led me to thinking and throughout just working on things for the podcast, whether, you know, something in an article brought up a memory, I've really started to look back at my everyday life and, you know, sincerely, I know that nobody can have the exact same situation that I've had. So I really want to make it a focal point of um, the podcast and even just larger communities um, of those living with an invisible illness that not one person has the exact same situation. So you know, I want to recognize that we all have commonalities, things um, that are similar, whether they're symptoms, um, the actual illness, um, backgrounds, all of those may be the same, but they're never going to be exactly the same. So I know that sometimes my reactions to certain things probably were, you know, were guided by experiences that I've had in the past. So at times I've actually went back and thought, okay, was I being judgmental about something? Um, you know, if there's been a big event in my life or something that's really upset me, I do try to write about it or look back on it and really see what was going on. And I've actually found many times after I've done that, I think maybe I ha reacted a little harshly or maybe the person that was trying to do something for me or said something didn't mean it in a negative way, but that's the way I took it. So... Um, you know, any given situation, it can go from, you know, one person has feelings of peace and calm, but the next person feels anger because it reminds them of a traumatic event. So just an understanding in general that, you know, this can happen in everyday life, that everybody experiences something differently, that will allow us to respect everybody else's opinion. So I have had things said and done to me, which you know, may or may not have been directly about my illness, but they made an impact on my life. And through some of those things, I really feel a need to root for the underdog, which you know, I know most people like doing that anyway. Um, and on social media, I really don't you know, try to comment too much on anything that might be controversial. I, you know, try to stay middle of the road in most cases. And, you know, I was just going through some comments and there was someone who was just really negative. And, you know, I replied something to the effect of, you know, I agreed with the original poster. And, you know, the actual topic was a little sensitive, so I'm not going to go into detail. But he made an assumption, probably from my profile, that I would agree with him. And when I came back and, you know, I said basically what I've been saying throughout the podcast, that each person um, needs to be looked at as an individual, that they need to be respected, and we shouldn't make assumptions about others. And he just found that, I don't know, I guess unusual that someone would think that, um, so I did find that a little strange and that kind of, that wore on me for a long time, probably longer than it should wear on anybody um, to think about something like that, but it did. Um, and then there was just some other experiences, you know, after that. So the last point or the last driving point that made me want to start this was in some comments on social media if someone was very vocal that, you know, everybody was being punished because all of those who were elderly or had underlying health conditions made the economy crash. Now, I can actually really understand his point. You know, he may have had a small business. I really didn't know him. We just had a mutual friend in common. And, you know, I tried to be empathetic, but I did reply you know, in regards to masks first, because he was also talking about masks and how that took away his rights. Um, you know, I personally don't really understand the big deal about masks because it's a slip of material you put over your face. And in, again, my personal opinion, if you tell me that it's even going to help one person not get sick, 
I'm going to be more than willing to do that. Um, if that's not really a big deal for me, but I do know that other people may not be able to wear that. Um, my son is older now, but my son is on the autism spectrum and he's very sensitive to some materials such as around his waist. Um, and if he were a little younger, I don't know how he would work with, you know, wearing a mask as well. So I definitely understand that. But as far as, you know, he was saying it was taking away his rights and his liberties, um, you know, that, that was a little hard to understand, but then he went you know, further to say that, you know, those who had underlying conditions, those who were elderly, how they were, you know, causing the lockdowns, causing businesses to crash. And, you know, I, I did take a step back and I looked and I was out of work for my illness, not for COVID. Um, my husband was also out of work at the time, but he actually started right back as um, the pandemic started. So that was kind of a blessing. So we weren't in the best financial situation, but I knew that we were in a better spot than a lot of people. Um, so, you know, I did write back and basically I explained, you know, I try to understand that people have different situations and that someone else, you know, is going to look at the lockdown and if they can't work because of that, if they're losing income, I definitely understand that it's having an impact on them, you know, but to blame pretty much everybody who has an underlying illness that that didn't really make sense either because younger people were getting sick. Younger people were having prolonged, you know, effects of COVID-19. And he just replied back that he wasn't even going to read my response and, you know, my life was not worth it. And that was it. Um, so I fumed for about a day and I thought I was going to write him back. And then I thought, well, if he said he's not even going to listen to my response, you know, why should I really take the time to expend that energy and write back to him? So I didn't. But then, you know, I said, if someone said that to me, there's probably other people out there saying similar things to other people whether it's an older person, whether it's someone who does have, you know, a condition that the CDC puts um, in the category of being at risk, um, you know, to blame everybody for the shutdown, that was also a little narrow sighted in you know, my opinion at the time. But again, I did take a step back and I didn't know him. You know, what if he, and his wife were both working and they didn't have anyone to watch the children. What if they didn't have a good secure Wi-Fi access? You know, any number of things that you know, may have made a person be you know, so, I, I guess the only word I can think of is so bold as to say someone's life was not worth it, is if they were in a situation where they would not be able to provide everything that they needed to get through. And I definitely, again, understood that, um, but it was very hard and very stressful for me to think about that. And pretty much I stayed focused on it. That's a fault of my own. You know, I, for one thing, I've never wanted anyone to ever be mad at me. So to have someone even come back with something like that that was just very hurtful and I really held on to it. But again, once I looked at everything, I don't know what he's going through. I did try to explain to him what I was going through. And while that opinion is really hard to say that I respect, what I can do is say, I understand that he is going through a situation that none of us could have ever anticipated and that his reaction, what he's saying, was more about the situation, not to me. And that let me let it go. I'm not necessarily saying that it was right for someone to say something like that, but by being able to think about what someone else has gone through, it gave me an understanding 
so that I do not hold on to that anger and you know, really be consumed by it, which I was. Um, but I do try if I do happen have to have access where I can, you know, order from a local business. I do try to do that because, you know, our downtown area where I live, it started to be revitalized. It was building up and then this happened. There were a couple of businesses that I really, you know, I, I'd enjoy and, you know, so far so good in that they are able to stay open. But I know that building that business, you know, that's, that's a labor of love and, you know, to have, to have to have that shut down because of a pandemic, I can't even imagine. And so, you know, I, I really want to show support when I can to those who have the smaller businesses. So, um, you know, again, I knew at the time that we were actually, you know, in a better position than others right now. Um, my husband did just get laid off a couple of um, weeks ago. So, you know, again, I'm in a completely different situation now as I was two months ago. So things are ever changing in that as well. Um, now, something that I think a lot of us can relate to that is common for many of us is how we might be treated by medical professionals. Now, there, there's been a time, a couple times actually, where I probably reacted very, very um, not typical of myself. Um, but I know through my journey of diagnosis, which um, last week I finished up a two parts on that, um, you know, there were times where I, you know, had some doctors, it, it really seemed like they were questioning what I was saying. And, you know, doctors are scientists. Um, they look at facts and, you know, there was something there that was intangible. They couldn't read it on a report. They couldn't see it on me physically, but I knew that there was something wrong. Um, so the response is sometimes not from everybody, not from every doctor or physician's assistant that I may have seen, but you know, some, I really got the feeling that they were questioning what I said. And, you know, at some point I started to think were, or was it the fact that they really didn't believe me or were they just frustrated because they hadn't figured it out? Um, and I do want to be very clear that I have a lot of respect for everybody in the medical profession. You know, again, they're scientists. They have to keep track of thousands and thousands and thousands of different facts from what causes these symptoms to what medications may interact with each other. So they have to be able to apply that knowledge at just a, mo at a moment's notice. And when they're presented with someone with a rare illness or an invisible illness that they can't see, it it kind of takes it to a point where that knowledge doesn't stick with anything that they know because they can't prove it at that point. And, you know, it did take a while for my diagnosis, but at the same time now I'm not, I'm not mad because, you know, when it, when I was first diagnosed, I was mad because I'd been to so many different doctors and I'm like, why didn't anybody put it together? But they, again, they couldn't see it. There's certain specific tests they had to run. And unless you narrow down everything else, those are tests that you wouldn't run typically on someone my age. So, you know, there's just so much right now, that even with the scientific advancements that we have, things that we just don't know about disease in the human body. And we've actually found that out this year. So, you know, even being able to, after the fact, look at, you know, the length of time it took to get to my diagnosis, I do understand it was something that, you know, it was very hard to, to diagnose. Now, there have been times where that still sticks in my mind, those um, feelings of doubt, where, you know, I, I knew a doctor was questioning me, that has stopped me from going to seek treatment sometimes. You know, I more than once 
I really held off on going to the hospital when I had an infection and I knew I had an infection and it was a weekend. I knew the immediate care centers um, because of me having a blood clot previously. They would not see me because um, the infection somehow, and I'm not a doctor, so I don't know how that all works, but sometimes people who have this infection get blood clots. So immediate care would send me to the hospital anyway. But because I did have experiences going to the hospital where I was questioned um, or, you know, it, it really seemed like they were doubting me, I really didn't want to go back. And I one time had a really bad experience where you know, the doctor actually told me he was running late. He got stuck in traffic and he didn't have time. A doctor, well, I think it was a physician's assistant, technically, actually said that. And, you know, I, I did yell and I am embarrassed after the fact. Um, I live in a small area. I knew a lot of people in that hospital, um, including, I think there were family members for something else down different you know, doors. So definitely I was embarrassed, but you know, anyone outside wouldn't have known what was said, but for, you know, the, the nurse not giving me a gown when I first came in and he just didn't have time to see me, all those thoughts came flooding, flooding back where people have doubted me. Um, I am not the smallest person in the world. I have been told by some doctors, um, we'll just stop eating and it'll take care of everything. It won't because people who are very small have my illness, but all of that came back and you know, I was just like, why are you doing this? You know, is it because, you know, I'm overweight? Is it because I have a number of visits to the ER and, you know, again, I did not act as well as I should have. Um, but that's because of past experiences. What I'm trying to show here is even someone who is normally acting one way, if they're put in a situation that reminds them of times that were very hard for them to deal with, they're going to react in ways that are very unusual for them. So, um, yeah, again, I, not my proudest moment, but I was really hurt at that time and I really didn't think that I would you get adequate health care. And that means the next time where I really felt I needed to go, I didn't go. And of course, when I contacted my doctor, she said, go to the ER. Um, because with this, with this particular thing, it can go from nothing to really, really severe in a number of hours sometimes. So, you know, I know what I need to do, but just those past experiences have really made me hold off on, you know, getting that medical treatment sometimes. Um, now, everybody's journey to their diagnosis is different. So, you know, someone may not have taken probably about the, I know mine was more than 10 years, but, you know, some may have a shorter time period. Some may go decades without the diagnosis. And, you know, now that I have been living with this diagnosis for almost eight years now, um, I, I know that my reactions and a lot of things are tainted by the years that it, it took for me to get that diagnosis. Um, and things are kind of rough in the fact that some of the symptoms of an initial flare up, um, they're the same as like the flu, um, respiratory infection, allergies. And right now some of the symptoms are similar to even COVID. So, you know, when I'm in a situation where I don't know, you know, is cough medicine going to work? Um, do I need to take more, you know, steroids for um, the flare up or is it something worse? And I just don't know. And to hesitate to not reach out for medical treatment because of those past experiences, it's really hard and it does weigh on my mind. Um, and what I really am trying to tell myself to get over that is I don't know what they are thinking. I don't know if that physician's assistant really had looked at my chart and thought, oh, well, this is the third time she's been here this year. 
not realizing that, you know, I usually try to get in touch with my doctor before I go. I didn't know if that's what he was thinking. It may have been legitimately he got stuck in traffic and he was having a bad day. And we all have bad days. So, you know, right now I've just spent, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes um, explaining some of my experiences and how they affected my thinking. Um, I know not everybody has had these negative experiences during the diagnosis, but we need to keep our eyes out and open for that so that our interactions with others, you know, they're as productive as they can be, that we keep an open flow of communication. Now, I did, um, you know, mention looking at some articles. And what I started to look at was um, some phrases that people say. And I was looking at the reactions and they're, there were two short articles and one person seemed very upbeat and positive and everybody was well-intentioned when they said something, even if it, you know, didn't come out the way they meant it. The other person seemed very cynical in that, you know, when someone says something, they mean it exactly letter by letter and, you know, then you know, they're being insensitive. So it was like two different versions and even things that, you know, I wouldn't find offensive. Some people, or the one person in that one article was finding offensive. You know, if someone asked if they can help me, I used to maybe get a little defensive, but, you know, I know that I can't do everything now. I mean, once I tried to move an empty filing cabinet just about 30 or 40 feet, and after five minutes, I may have gotten it 10 feet. And someone saw me and he came and stopped me and said, why are you doing this? And I didn't want to give it up, but he's like, no, let me move it. And he moved it, you know, all the way where it needed to go in like, you know, less than a minute. And I was just like, Ugh. I did feel defeated. But now I understand he did that because he didn't want me to hurt myself. And I was probably going to hurt myself. Um, <laughs> so... Um, going back to some of the things people might say to us that we might take different ways is, oh, you don't look sick or you look great. Um, people can take that different ways. Um, so for, you know, one, one person might be trying to build you up saying, hey, you look great. Um, you know, just trying to make you feel positive. But on the other hand, it could be said, in a way where it's like, well, you, you shouldn't take any longer to finish something up because you look just fine. Two different, you know, reactions, but those might be, you know, things that we encounter every day. So, you know, um, it reminded me of someone that I didn't know who had MS, I'm not going to name names or anything, but she um, she had a physically demanding job and after a while she couldn't do it. She worked for as long as she could. And then she had to file for social security disability. And she was always of the thought that when you go somewhere, you try to look your best, you know, not like glamorous or anything, but you know, make sure your hair is, is done. Maybe put on a little bit of makeup, nothing really heavy, but that actually was part of the problem is when she would go in for a hearing, she looked pretty, you know, put together. She looked well. She didn't look sick um, according to what was expected. She was also relatively young. Um, I'm not talking like right out of high school or anything like that, but she was still relatively young. And that also played a role in what some people might assume or think. Um, you know, when they see someone in their 20s or 30s who, you know, aren't able to work. Um, so we may also hear things like, oh, I understand completely. I've been through something like that, or I know what you're feeling. And you know, sometimes when I hear that, I just want to come back saying, oh, so you know how it feels that when you wake up, you literally don't know how you're going to feel. You don't know if you're going to wake up to... You know, I can get everything accomplished today or, you know, I can just make it through today down to I can't even move. So, you know, to hear something of, 
you know, I know what you're feeling or I understand what you're going through. I think it gets our, you know, our hackles up for lack of a better term. We want to become defensive. But at the same time, unless that person is a really, really close friend or relative, they may actually know something about what I'm going through. Again, not exactly the same, but they may have had experiences personally in their life or with family members, and they might understand. They really might, and I've gotten defensive. So I'm just trying to look at it from that perspective as well. Um, you know, I did go in a little bit earlier about, you know, the offer to help. Um, I think going back to, it's this, at least for me, I don't want to ask for help or take help because it feels like I'm not doing anything that, um, going back to, if you've heard a podcast with my sister where I've mentioned it, she had passed away also from an auto-inflammatory disease and or complications, I should say, from it. You know, she, on her last phone call, told me she didn't feel like she was you know, really a productive member of society. She felt like she you know, really wasn't doing anything important. And, you know, at least I think part of the reason I don't want to ask for help is I always want to make sure that I'm accomplishing something or I'm doing something. Um, the problem is if I overdo it, I could end up getting in a flare up. I could hurt myself and that's not doing anything any better. You know, um, you know, thinking about that last conversation is hard. And, you know, I did mention briefly earlier that I'm not working now. And I fought that for about three years. You know, my doctors wanted me to start looking at going out of work, but I just could not bring myself to do that until I had a really severe infection last year. And the infection itself is not related to the illness that I have, but at the same time, the medications I take decrease my immune system. And then when I have an infection, I can get a flare up that makes it even worse. So um, it, they kind of play off each other. Um, so after that really bad infection, I was at a point where my body just couldn't come back to where it used to be. Um, that sometimes just taking a shower is everything that I can, you know, do for the day, which, you know, it's, it's hard because it's just anything, just being able to do anything is hard at times. And, you know, my heart tells me, keep going, keep working. You can do this, but my mind is saying, you can't. And you know, just last year, I came to that, that um, acceptance. Um, now, probably the last thing I want to talk about as far as conceptions right now is this whole mind over body thing. Um, I don't know how many of you may have heard things such as, oh, well, just think positive. You can get through this, which is kind of funny considering part of the reason I started a podcast was to try to remain positive. Um, but I think I mean it in a slightly different way in that I'm looking at taking you know, what you have, your experiences, the situation that you're in and trying to remain positive throughout as compared to think positive and it'll all go away, which I've heard sometimes, um, you know, things like that. Um, you know, even just, well, get a little bit more rest and you, know, you should be fine. Almost like it's, you know, a cold that you need to get over. Um, it's not really that. <laughs> like I said some earlier, some of the symptoms are similar to that, but trust me, it is not that. Um, so I have learned to accept my limitations. I have learned though that when someone offers help, they're not doing it to say, you know, that I can't finish something or I can't do something. So 
what I've had to learn to do is understand that, um, realize that someone cares about me and that's why they're offering their help. Um, okay. So you know, that was really most of the thoughts that I had um, just over this past week. I really don't want to go too much longer because I usually try to stay around 30 minutes in my podcast. Um, so I hope that, you know, you got to learn a little bit more about me through this. Um, you know, again, I know it was a little different than what I've done in the past, but I think it's important that as members of a larger community, that we really understand what each person brings and that everybody brings positives. Um, you know, they bring their experiences and their strength and you know, their adaptability with ways of coping. We all bring that to a larger group of individuals who face challenges every day. So, you know, I just think it's important to get to know the individuals on that. So, um, you know, I'll leave my contact information in the description of the podcast or the video. Um, I, you know, I hope that if you really like the way I did this, please let me know. If you are like, nope, don't ever do that again. Also, let me know because I really just want to get better at, you know, sharing my experiences with everyone. And I hope it didn't sound like I was going too far off on a tangent about, um, you know, the way some people reacted with the lockdown. Um, you know, and I had feelings about that too. I, we all did. Um, but how that's impacted me this year, the way I've interacted with others, you know, we're just all facing new challenges every day on top of the ones that we already face. So um, I just wanted to share some of my thoughts about how to handle things or how I handle things when I'm feeling really upset and, you know, just trying to look at everybody's perspective and see things from their purview as well. So um, if you do like my podcast, please feel free to share it. Um, I'm not really familiar with how everybody can leave a review. I know a lot of reviews can be left on um, Apple or iTunes. If you do watch this through the YouTube video, um, make sure that you like and subscribe. What that does is, you know, it makes it more viewable for others. I think it makes it more easy to find the podcast when, um, you know, there's likes or there's reviews or things like that. So, you know, if you can just go ahead and do that, that would really help the podcast. Um, next week, um, I hope to have this next one finished. I'm actually looking at um, doing something about how a pandemic was handled in 1918, the Spanish flu compared to now. Um, and also within that, I wanted to focus on technology and how that's especially impacted those who have an invisible illness, how some of the things that we can do today would not have even been thought of in 1918 and how we've learned to adjust and cope with that because we learn to adjust and cope with everything. Um, I also was looking at, you know, possibly doing something about, you know, healthcare apps, um, health technology, and how that's impacted our lives for either the better or worse, you know, kind of weighing pros and cons. Um, you know, so I have a couple ideas for going forward, but I did just want to come in and, you know, touch base. Um, again, thinking of everybody who's been impacted by this weather. Um, you know, I, I really just hope that everybody has been able to, you know, find a nice warm place and, you know, been able to take care during this time. So I hope to listen or I hope to talk to you all next week. Have a good rest of your week and stay safe. Thanks.